Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, 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 welcome. My name is Alyssa Stone. I am the Director of Programs at The Crucible in Oakland, California, and we are so excited to welcome you to The Crucible's very first virtual artist talk. Um, we can't wait to get started. You can say a hello to us in the chat box. Give us a quick shout out, say hello and where you're watching from. We are going to keep guests on mute through the talk. If you have questions that you would like to ask Rachel Ann, go ahead and type them into your chat box and I'll read them towards the end so that you can join in on our virtual artist talk as well. If you're just joining us, my name again is Alyssa Stone. I'm the Director of Programs at The Crucible in West Oakland and welcome to our very first virtual artist talk here with The Crucible. I assume you might know who we are at The Crucible, but just in case, since 1999, The Crucible has been an important cultural arts organization and community in the Bay Area. We serve more than 5,000 students a year, work with over 45 local schools offering classes, workshops, and site visits, and have the pleasure of introducing so many students to the transformative power and confidence-building experience of making art. Over 20,000 people each year interact with our classes and programs, with 64% of the young people we serve receiving financial aid to participate. For many, the Crucible is the industrial arts school in the Bay Area, known for high quality teaching and a vibrant artist community. However, since the COVID-19 situation erupted in our area, the Crucible has had to cancel or postpone more than 200 classes and programs. Because of that, we want to make sure that we're continuing to engage with our artistic community. And so we have started our series of virtual artist talks every Friday at three o'clock. If you've just joined us again, hello. My name is Alyssa Stone. I'm the director of programs at the Crucible in West Oakland, California. We will be keeping guests on mute for the duration of our artist talk, but please give us a hello in the chat function and tell us where you're watching from. And if you would like to ask any questions for Rachel and our artist today, type them into the chat box and we'll ask them towards the end of our talk together. While we are sad to be closed during this situation, we could not be more excited to connect with our community in new ways and get to sit down with Rachel and Palacios today for our very first virtual artist talk. We are going to get through this and we are asking our community to support us by becoming a men member, purchasing a gift certificate, donating directly or buying art directly from our incredible community of artists and faculty members by visiting our website thecrucible.org. That's thecrucible.org. Check out our site for how you can join in our community and help us thrive through this situation and be able to resume operations as soon as we are able. We encourage you throughout this talk to send us questions in the chat function um, and we'll go ahead and ask them towards the end of our time together. Before I jump in and introduce our amazing artist today, Rachel Ann Palacios, I have a couple shout outs I want to give for all who have helped to make this possible. First and foremost, I want to give a big thanks to our executive director, Susan Murnett, who has been the incredible leader for us throughout this whole situation. I also want to give a shout out to our marketing dynamic duo, Natasha Von Canell, our Director of Marketing and E-Commerce, and Kathy Nyland, our Marketing Associate, who have helped to make me look nice and help make this all possible. A big shout out as well to CFO Renee Ventimiglia and Director of Operations and Facilities, Kua Patton, who are both helping to make sure we weather this storm together. Today we are talking with Rachel Ann Palacios, artist and educator extraordinaire. Rachel Ann has made a name for herself in the Bay Area art world. A self-taught multicultural artist, her pieces reflect the respect she has for culture, religion, traditional values, elders, and the cycle of life and death. In addition to her artwork, she has been a panelist for the Oakland Cultural Arts Funding Program, has been an active member of the Dia de los Muertos Committee at the Oakland Museum, and was a museum educator for 10 years with the Oakland Museum of California. 
She is now sharing her cultural arts education programming with libraries throughout the Bay Area and is a co-chair of the Cultural Arts Committee at Cleveland Elementary in Oakland. I am so excited to have our very first virtual artist talk with Rachel Ann Palacios, so please join me in a warm virtual welcome by saying hello to Rachel Ann. Hi. Rachel Ann, we are so glad uh, that you are our first featured artist for our talk. Uh, being as this is our first time, we're all discovering new things together. Um, and one of the new things that we're going to discover today is a little bit about your art form. Um, you are an artist who works most commonly with the repujado art form. Would you tell us a little bit about the history of repujado and what does repujado mean? Sure. Repujado started between the 12th and 16th century in, um, in colonial times. And I'm most familiar with repujado from Latin America, mainly Mexico. Um, repujado means to push or to emboss and deboss designs into either tin or metal. Um, and you can use different tools from hammers and nails or just a pencil, um, our styluses, and other types of other types of engraving tools to create your designs. Awesome. For those who are just joining us, we've just welcomed Rachel Ann Palacios, one of our artists and educators at the Crucible in Oakland. Um, we are learning today about the art form of repujado, which Rachel is an expert in. Could you tell us a little bit about the cultural significance of repujado and metal embossing? Is repujado exclusively related to religious iconography or is it something different? So repujado isn't exclusively related to iconography. I feel that repujado can be, or actually ojalata. Ojalata is the art and repujado is the actual process of doing it. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of confusion around it but the art of repujado is actually doing the embossing into the metal. Um, you can use silver, brass, or copper, or paper. And um, it, I'm, like I said, I'm familiar with the, the type that is from Mexico and Latin America. And you can put any design that you want. Usually, repujado represents um, a lot of the images, our our hands, hearts, things that are in milagros, which are these tiny little metal pieces that you can use for prayers or things that you want to have come to you. But I like to incorporate different designs, especially when I'm working with the kids in schools. I encourage them to draw their own pictures of what they enjoy, like fruit or a superhero or whatnot, and, and translate that into the tin. Cool, thank you. Um, so I want to dive in a little bit about you. You are our first featured artist, um, and I know a lot of people maybe are familiar with you from the Crucible or from your work around the community at the Oakland Museum. When did you first start practicing repujado or metal embossing? Um, what were some of your initial challenges with the art form? I would I say I started with repujado in the early 2000s. Um, just from stuff that my grandma had in the house, I wanted to try to copy it and do some something different. And so I started making little repujado pieces, but I couldn't quite find the right material. So I would fir I first started using just regular tin cans, like Dr. Pepper, Coca-Cola cans, and trying to do my designs in there and using a hammer and nail, and it didn't come out that great. And then I looked into it a little bit more, and then I found this tooling aluminum, which is like a softer gauge. It's a little bit thicker than... Uh, aluminum foil, but thinner than what I was trying to use. And so I started doing some random designs on there. And I was doing henna at the time also. So I started kind of mixing those designs into the aluminum patterns that I was working with. And it kind of took off from there. Um, I was a little frustrated because I'm not the best, like artistically, I'm not, I'm challenged artistically. When I want to draw like faces or animals or people, it's not great, but I can do line work and flowers galore. And so trying to find my balance in what looks good in repujado and what I want it to look like has been, has been a challenge, but now I know my place and I kind of stick to the same, the same thing. For those of us who aren't as familiar with metal and gauge type vocabulary, could you tell us a little bit about what you mean when you say gauge? 
So the gauge means the thickness of the type of metal that I use. Um, for the tooling aluminum, the silver tool, tooling aluminum that I use, it's a 36 gauge, so it's really pliable and soft. Um, it gets thicker and thicker the more you want to create like mirrors or boxes and things. I, I haven't gotten that far yet. That's what I'm hoping that the crucible will help me with um, eventually when I start doing more stuff there. And so, yeah, the gauge just means the thickness of, of the metal. Cool, thank you. Um, what is an early artistic experience that has stuck with you and you feel like put you on this path to becoming an artist and educator? The earliest experience that I could remember is this art project that we did in kindergarten. It was 1979, Garfield Elementary. Um, my teacher, Miss Edna Owens, had us decorating these ceramic Victorian homes. And so she gave us each like a little paint tray and we painted it. It was like a Mother's Day gift or something. And so I painted it and I was super proud of it. And I brought it home to my mom and she was pretty happy. Uh, she was pretty happy with it. So I'm like, hey, I guess I guess I'm an artist. And so my, she still has it. I have to go find it. And when when I do, I'll, po I'll post it on my Instagram so that you can see that <laughs> that random piece of art. But that kind of started my interest in doing any type of art. You mentioned that you went to Garfield Elementary, which is an Oakland school. You actually are part of a multi-generational Oakland family. Um, you're third generation Oakland. Your kids are fourth generation Oakland, which is amazing. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what brought your family from Central and South America to Oakland? Yeah, well, my great-grandparents left uh, Mexico and El Salvador in the early 1900s and they came to West Oakland. My great-grandfather worked on the railroads and helped build those and my great-grandma was a cook and a nanny actually in San Francisco in Russian Hill so she watched kids and made food um, and so they stayed they stayed here for work and they never went back and I'm super honored that they came to Oakland out of all of the places they could go. They could have stayed in LA, they could have stayed in the Central Valley but they came to Oakland and um, we're here, and I'm, I'm proud of my city. When people ask where I'm from or what my culture is from, I say I'm, I'm Oakland. I'm a Chicana from Oakland. And my dad came from Peru in, in the 70s um, for work and just to see what the United States was like. And so, yeah. Awesome. Uh, I also am a proud Oaklander, so I love to, love to find other Oakland natives, and I'm really glad that you stayed in Oakland. Um, you have talked about going back to Mexico, though, um, to learn about your craft of repujado, only to be viewed as an outsider because you are an American. How does the practice of repujado keep you connected to your tr family tradition of art making, and does it connect you in other ways? Well, when I first went to Mexico to start finding where repujada was made and asking questions, looking for the artesanos or the artisans that actually do this craft or practice this craft, um, people were like, why do you want to learn how to do this? And I'm like, this is part of my culture. Like, I'm so, I'm, I'm American, but I'm very proud of my heritage and where my family's come from. And I feel that connecting with art helps me stay connected to my culture and it helps me learn or continue to learn new words that I don't use in the span in Spanish um, and it also helps me see the people who have been doing this forever and ever ever I get to ask them questions and you know it's usually older males that do this and so they question why why do you want to do this there's not very much money in arts but this is just something that gives me peace of mind it helps me feel like I'm connected to my ancestors and I just I feel like like it's a gift and I should use it so what does it mean for you to be a female practitioner of repujado you've mentioned that it's a very male dominated art form um, is it unusual to find other women in this art practice you know, when I've gone to Mexico, I've never seen any other women working on the repujado. It's usually the wives or sisters or other family members who are selling the work, but not actually doing the work. And so when I go there and they see this woman in her mid forties coming, well, I started doing this a while ago, but now I've been going for so long that people, um, they kind of recognize me and know who I am. Sorry. 
somebody's doing their gardening outside <laughs> and using a leaf blower. Anyhow. Oh, okay, um, we can barely hear it. Okay, good. Um, and so anyway, I lost my train of thought now. Um, you've been going back to Mexico and seeing who's been selling the work versus who's been making the work. Right. And so just seeing that the men are behind the scenes doing the work and the women are selling it, I there's different stereotypes in our Latino culture where women are supposed to just stay behind and clean the house and watch the kids and not be up front doing, doing the actual practice of repujado. And so I'm trying to break that stereotype and, you know, do it for my family, show my daughter that she can do anything also. There are no limitations in art. Um, yeah. What are some ways you navigate what people expect from Central and South American artwork versus what you know to be true as the kind of large world of art from Central and South America? Let's see. How do I navigate what they expect? Well, I just try to be true and explain to them, you know, that this is something that I would like to practice. This is something that people are interested in learning about in America. and. And that's, that's it. How does teaching repujado to others relate to that? Well, it's really interesting when I go to a school or to a library and I work with the kids, they're pretty interested in, they're like, wow, metal art, we've never done this before. Some of us have never seen repujado before. And so, um, just showing them what the art form is like and telling them about a little bit about the culture and the history and encouraging them that this is something that anybody can do is very, I think, I think they feel empowered. I feel like I know you as much as a repujado artist as I do know you as a henna artist. How does the pattern making of henna art relate and influence your repujado pieces? It actually makes repujado a little bit easier for me just because I have these pattern these patterns um, in my brain already and I've been doing them over and over for years and so I feel pretty confident about the the floral patterns and the vines that I create and so that that's easy to translate onto the repujado. Now as far as drawing other photographs and things for me to translate that's where I get kind of stuck and I'm not sure how it comes out but people buy it so I'm, I'm thinking and assuming that they like it. <laughs> um, you've mentioned some of the flower patterns that you do or some of the swirls. Um, what do some of the patterns that you use signify in your artwork? Well a lot of the most of the repujado that I create is centered around hearts and people, everybody has a heart. And so when people are wanting to buy art, this they kind of might connect with, with their heart. And so sometimes I'll create this kind of thing. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Great. And so sometimes I'll work on other things like hands. And sometimes I'll work on other things like boxes. This is actually one of the first things that I made inspired by this type of thing. So this is the real ojalata from Mexico, from Guanajuato. And then I created my own out of the tooling aluminum that I used to do my other art. It is so cool to see your art pieces, and um, maybe as we continue on with the talk, we'll have you hold up some of your pieces again, because they're so exquisite. Um, for people who aren't familiar, would you talk about the process of repujado? Walk us through the steps of making a piece. Sure. So, repujado, I talked a little bit earlier about the tooling aluminum that I use. So, I can cut tooling aluminum to any size. Um, this is usually the same size that I, I bring to my classes for students. So the first thing that I'll do is I'll create a pattern. So it'll be something like this, like a heart, or I have other images that I use with my students, like 
this type of Day of the Dead. So I'll give them like a blank skeleton and then they can do their own embellishments on it. So once they do all of their little doodads and extra things that they want to create, I'll have them tape the image to the tin. And then we, we usually just use pencils because that's the easiest thing. And a little foam pad underneath to give it some cushion. Um, sometimes when I want to get really fancy, I will bring corn dog sticks or um, candy apple sticks just because it's a little bit different. Um, and I'll have the kids do their designs um, with the repujado. So all you have to do is put your design on, make sure it's taped down really well and secure, and you just trace. And then if you want to see how your piece has come out, just turn it around. Don't take the tape off because then you'll lose your place. And so when they're done, I have them make sure that everything that they want to do is, is on their pattern. And then we use good old Sharpies to color it in. Um, they're nice and easy and they can be cleaned up super easy with alcohol. And yeah, that's, that's one, that's, that's how we do Repujado. How does creating this art influence your connection with family and children, your children or the students that you have the chance to work with? Well, it's really cool for me to be able to sit over them or in the classroom with them and see what they're doing and tell them that I really like the pattern that they created. Awesome. Sometimes the kids do different like squiggles and patterns around the actual piece which kind of inspires me I'm like I'm gonna go home and do that and so we they just feel really good when they're encouraged and when they're they're told that their stuff looks super cool and so I feel connected to them and they're like when are we gonna learn something else or what else can we do with this type of art and so something else that we started creating are these uh, for those who celebrate Christmas you can do a tree topper and so this gives it a different type. Instead of just carving into it, we can actually manipulate the tin so that it's, it has a shape. And so they get super excited about that too. It's cool that the art form is 2D and 3D and 4D. Practically, you can do all sorts of different um, patterns and shapes with it. What are your thoughts around craft versus artwork? How have these interpretations influenced your work and growth? Well, a lot of people, like when I first started doing my art and I would go to like the Berkeley flea market or one of the little uh, street fairs here in, or some of the street fairs here in Oakland, um, I was known or I was thought of as a crafter, which I am. I like being crafty. Um, a lot of the stuff that I create is raw and it might look a little bit unfinished and it, it takes on the style of folk art, which is supposed to be kind of like raw and, and, you know, indigenous or um, what's the other word I want to use? Anyway, it'll come to me. And so I had a hard time admitting or just feeling that I was an artist, like a professional artist because crafting is supposed to be different. But I feel in my heart, after years and years of beating myself up over, over the thought, I am an artist. The art, the craft, and the just art of making something is, is fine art. It is art. So it could look as weird and janky as it needs to look, or it can be as refined as it needs to look. I, I, I still feel <laughs> that, that everything is, is art, and it's beautiful. Do you feel like some of your earliest interactions with your grandmother or mother have helped to shape how you interpret your own artwork and yourself as an artist? I do. I mean, to my grandmother and my nana, Rose in particular, she's right here on my ofrenda. Um, she was super encouraging of my art. She always hung it up. I always made it a point to make something for her for Christmas or for her birthday, um, for Mother's Day, and she would put it up and be super proud of it when people would come over or when her friends would stop by and they're like, Oh, where'd you get that from? And even if it looked a little bit funny or silly, she, she always said that her granddaughter made it and it's cool. And as, as it got better, when I got older, like into adulthood, 
um, people would ask me to make things for them for like birthday parties or put a picture of somebody who's passed away into one of the nichos. And so it's kind of an honor to have like our family and friends want, want to actually pay for things and then me go to their house and see them hanging up. So it's, I, it's my connection to her is still, she's been gone for 15 years, but I still remember all of the things that she said to me and just that is what keeps me motivated and going. I know that it makes her spirit happy. So our ancestors certainly live through us and definitely through our art. Um, you are a metal artist, but you're part of our leather textiles and fine arts department at the Crucible. Uh, what are some of your first experiences teaching at the Crucible? And tell us about a couple of the things you've done since joining our community. Uh, the first I think the very first thing that I was able to do was the leather work. I was a teaching assistant in the leather work class and I got so excited just because I've never really worked with leather. So I learned how to cut, like cut belts and I learned how to use these really cool tools that I'd never seen before. I had some ideas of doing some um, like leather burning, putting my henna designs on leather. I came home with some scraps and started making some earrings. And so it was really fun. And the experience was, it's, it was super intimate. There were only eight of us in the classroom. And so Ricky, who was the lead instructor, was very kind in, you know, giving everybody their attention and, you know, teaching me how to do certain things so that when it came my turn to be able to do the leather work class that I felt grounded and secure. So there's a really good, um, there's a really good foundation there with, with people and, uh, helping them guide the new people that come into the crucible on how to do the classes and they don't just, they don't just leave you hanging. And uh, it was, it was just a really good experience and I got super excited to start teaching. So some of the other things that I have done at the crucible were the spring, the spring open house last year, which was amazing. I got to meet a lot of the faculty and staff um, and I got to show my artwork. And then Gifty was another amazing um, event that was at the Crucible in December. So it's this huge holiday fair and artists from all over come and show their artwork. And if, if you've never been there, you should go. There's so many cool different things and there's demos. You can come and try out a class before it happens to see if it's something that you might want to do. So I'm, ex I'm really excited. Thank you for having me be a part of, of, of the Crucible. Well, we're very lucky to have Rachel Ann as part of the Crucible. Um, Rachel Ann mentioned a couple of our large-scale community events that we usually host at the Crucible, and we can't wait to get back to hosting them. Um, we often, uh, we usually offer two large-scale open houses plus our gifty artisan vendor market in December. So hopefully, we are resumed uh, by then, and we'll be able to welcome all of you to the Crucible very soon. Um, Rachel Ann also gave a little shout out to Ricky Smeltzer. Um, who had been our department head for the leather textiles and fine arts department. Um, also a wonderful artist in his own right and an incredible community member. Um, we are going to shift gears a little bit to um, how you are working with art and how it's helping you to cope through this situation right now. Um, but before we totally switch gears, I just want to do a quick reset for anyone who joined our, our conversation a little bit late. Um, my name's Alyssa Stone. I'm the Director of Programs at The Crucible. And today we are featuring the incredible artist, Rachel Ann Palacios, who is a repujado artist and henna artist as well, and part of our faculty at The Crucible in Oakland. If you're just joining our conversation, we are keeping our guests on mute today, but we welcome you to say hello and uh, let us know where you're listening from in our chat box. And you can ask us questions in the chat box, which I'll read out loud towards the end. We already have one question that's come through, so thank you for giving us a question. Um, if you've got additional questions for Rachel Ann about her work and about Repujado, please type those into the chat box and I'll read them out loud at the end. Um, so Rachel Ann, jumping back in, we know that this has been a wild time for people and especially for artists, certainly in our community at the Crucible and throughout the Bay Area and across the globe. Um, we want to hear a little bit from you about how you're handling the situation and what you found throughout. Um, so now that we are in week three of the shelter in place mandate here in the Bay Area, could you tell us about your creative process while in shelter in place? 
How has creating in quarantine been for you? Well, first and foremost, I'm a mom. And so my human art creations have come first. So I've had to work on schoolwork with them. And I mean, I'm blessed that I'm an educator. It makes it a little bit easier for me to have patience with them and show them things. So that was first and foremost. Second thing that came to mind was, okay, cool. I have all the time in the world to do art. So I'm going to work on things that I have had sitting around in, in the studio. But I felt a little bit of pressure also. Like I wasn't really, I hear feedback. Sorry. I wasn't really feeling inspired. I was feeling really sad and scared. And so I had to kind of push myself and take myself out of the out of the hole that I was in and just go in, look through some of the old work that I created and then, you know, finish it up and then start on some new stuff. And it also gave me an opportunity to be with, with the kids and have them help me paint things, have them tracing things out for me. And so a lot of the new work that's going to come out for the summer um, is going to have their hands in it too. So I'm really happy that that, that worked, but I'm not going to lie. This has been a really difficult time. I like hugging my friends. I like being around people, um, that make me feel good and to have this stay away, especially from my mom and my mother-in-law and people that I love is not, it's not easy. I'm giving you a virtual hug right now. I'm giving everybody a virtual <laughs> hug right now. Virtual hugs all around. Yes. I see some of, uh, some of our watchers giving some virtual hugs. So you're getting a lot of love from our, from our guests today, Rachel Ann. Um, what was the evolution of your experience creating art during this period? Um, well, I guess getting back into the studio and finding the stuff that I hadn't worked on gave me a little bit of, I guess, fire behind me to be able to get things going. Sorry, my neighbor. Hello, neighbor. Um, and so it, it, it gave me more of a grounding also because it's like I have all this stuff. I need to use it. I need to do something with it. I can't go anywhere. So I might as well just like work on it. And so I've been carving time out of my day to be able to work on things here and there, reorganize things, look for supplies for my students when I get back to school to be able to teach. I'm finding all these cool things and new ideas of classes that I want to teach them in art form. So, so yeah. What has helped you find your way back into creating art after you took care of your family first and took care of yourself? What, well, I guess my spirituality, um, thinking about how my ancestors, like what they went through, before there was any technology or before there was any kind of, before there were any cars or any, before there was anything else in their village or where they, where they came. So just looking at that and remembering that I came from some strong people, Aztecs, Mayans, Inca cultures, they, they had to work to survive. And so I, I do this to survive. And, you know, like I said, it kind of gave me some more, how do I want to say it? It just gave me more thoughts uh, around being grateful for what I have and to use what I have to get what I need. That's really beautifully said. Thank you. Might you have any suggestions for artists out there who are feeling stuck or distracted in their practice during this time? Well, don't be so hard on yourself, one. I mean, I was tripping out the first few days, like, why, why am I not in the garage making anything? You know, I have all this stuff and, you know, but don't be too hard on yourself. Relax. We don't really get the time to sit and relax or just zone out and look, look out the window. You know, this is time that was kind of just given to us because of the situation. And so we're pretty free to do what we want to do in that space, whether it's we want to reconnect with the kids, um, you know, that's, that's one really important thing to do. Reconnect with your kids, train, retrain them in their duties at home, uh, cleaning, show them how to cook. Um, we've been cooking together. What else can you do with your family? You know, if you, if you feel like you need to do schoolwork with them, 
go over it with them. I noticed that my kids like are really strong. Some of them, my daughter doesn't really, she's not a very strong, um, she doesn't comprehend stuff really well. And so me being able to see how she is in classroom, the classroom with reading stuff and then solving the problems, I'm able to sit there with her and go over things. And so I'm really grateful that I'm able to see this because this is something that I don't know that goes down at school. Like, and for my son too, same thing. I'm seeing where his strengths and weaknesses are and I'm able to just really be connected to them in that sense to where I've had, I had to give that up when they started kindergarten. It is definitely a, a gift to have time to reconnect with ourselves and our loved ones far and, and close. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, our last question from me before we open it up to our guest questions. So if you do have a question that you'd like to ask Rachel Ann, we've been grabbing those in the chat function. So go ahead and type them into the chat function and I'll read them out loud. Um, but my last question before we open it up to our audience is what has been a surprising discovery for you during this time of shelter in place in Oakland? Surprising discovery. Uh, the sky is a lot bluer. There isn't very much traffic. Um, our Oakland community is behaving themselves really well. Um, and it's really nice to see, I'm, I'm trying not to watch the news, but it's really nice to see these like panoramic views of the streets being completely empty. I feel like I live in, like this little utopian town and not this like up and coming suburban Oakland place. So it's been nice to have the quiet around. It's also been really interesting to see people, my neighborhood's kind of tucked away, but it's been interesting to see new, new faces walking around and, and discovering, discovering little pockets of Oakland. Awesome. Yeah, I also, I've loved, um, it's been a little quieter in my pocket of Oakland as well, um, but it's been nice to still walk around and uh, just being able to wave to people is always really nice. Six feet apart, of course. <laughs> okay. That's something that I noticed too. Everybody that I've seen, I've waved to or I've said hello to, just because people aren't very personal anymore. It's like everybody's so busy, they walk by and they're just too busy to like look up. And now, I mean, all we have is time and, you know, we're just kind of moseying around the neighborhood. So you might as well greet somebody while in passing. Totally. I hope that... Um I hope that one thing that we hold on to once this is all lifted is our connection to one another, connection to strangers and our neighbors. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited now to uh, read some of the audience questions. If you've got a question, fabulous guests, please go ahead and type it into the chat box. We've got a few more minutes with Rachel Ann Palacios, and so we'd love to hear from you and things that you wonder about as well. Um, our first question is, how do you make the pieces hang on a wall? I put them in frames just so that they're official pieces of art. Uh, I like to do that with the kids. I don't, I used to just have them do the repujado and I would give it to them. And then we evolved into putting it on some cardboard and putting it on a magnet to put on the fridge. But then I was like, you know what, let's like step it up a little bit and have everybody feel official. So um, we put them in frames now, or I make a little loop behind it. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but there's like right here, there's like this little hook that where you can hang your repujado piece on the wall with a nail. Does that work? Yeah. Another question from our audience. How do you balance the, I have so much stuff here to work on and I might as well work on it with the real need to find downtime to recharge your creative juices. Do you have ideas for ways to keep one's creative self healthy? Yes, with the type, of, the type of person I am, I like to do way too many things at once. So this time has actually made me develop a schedule. Um, having to balance having the kids around too. It's like, all right, I'm gonna work on these two things while they're doing their math. And then I'm, we're going to have lunch, we're going to take a walk, we're going to take a nap, and then we're going to get back and finish what we started earlier. And so have, making a schedule and having like a flexible schedule helps um, just to give you some time to not 
feel pressured to finish something or do something. I mean, we're going to be stuck here for a little while, so you got time. <laughs> what was your favorite art piece you've ever made and why? Um, my favorite art piece, you know, I think my favorite art piece was the one that I actually showed you in the very beginning, this Frida, because it actually turned out to look like something. And it, it's so old, but it's just, it was like a stationary box of cards that I had. And then if you really want to know how I used to hang stuff, this is fishing line that I would put on the inside of the box. And so I really love this piece. I haven't been able to part with it. Sometimes I bring it when I set up and people ask about it, but I can't part with it because it's the first real thing that actually looks like, like one of the boxes from Guanajuato that I, that I went to find when I, when I traveled to Mexico for the first time. So that is a, a special piece and definitely something to hold on to. Um, okay, another question from our audience. Y'all are sending a lot of really great questions, so you can keep them coming. Uh, so we have one guest who met you last year at an open house and fell in love with you and your work. We all fall in love with you, Rachel Ann. You're such a gem of a human. Um, Thank you. This, I wish this, everybody thought that way. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this question has to do with iconography. Um, okay. Specifically, they've seen and fell in love with your Prince and Frida works. Why or how do you uh, do they play such a prominent role in your work? Frida, definitely. I've had the hugest crush on her for as long as I could remember until I could finally really know who she was. I when I first started reading about her, I I tried to buy every single book that existed so that I could learn about her. And I just, her life and my life are kind of parallel. I mean, I didn't get into an accident or anything, but a <laughs> lot of the things that she stood for, I haven't gotten knock on wood. A lot of the things that she stood for um, are things that I believe in. And she was a trailblazer in like the thirties and four, or even in like the twenties when she was going to school, she didn't care what people thought about how she dressed or what she did and she just kept moving and didn't let it affect her I mean I know inside she was really self-conscious about stuff um and so so am I I relate I relate to that part of her but just knowing that she survived all these different random happenings and she just kept pushing um is inspiring and then Prince oh my goodness that Prince is one of my favorite, favorite artists. If not, he's probably one of the top five favorite artists in, in the universe. And I, as soon as he died, I came home and I made a Nietzsche of him just because his music and his quirkiness and everything about him. The first time I saw Prince was, uh, I think it was like on, it was on a, I don't know if it was Saturday Night Live, but it was on one of the late night talk shows when I shouldn't have been awake. I was about five and he's dancing around in his underwear and a trench coat. And I'm like, who is this guy that looks like a lady? You know, I love this. And then he, and then I saw another, something else of him with like heels on. And my grandma would always say in Spanish, but she would always say, Hey, look at that guy with his little heels on. I wonder how he dances so well. And I'm like, he's awesome. <laughs> and so I fell in love with him with every stage, diamonds and pearls, controversy, Prince and the Revolution, like I, I'm a huge, huge fan. And so I, I'm hoping that he feels honored that I am honoring, honoring him. And I like making connections with the people that love him as much as I do too, so. I love that. Thank you for sharing an uh, um, artist that you love. Um, so we have a technical question now. On thinner gauge metal pieces, do you fill the back with anything to prevent further dents or distortion? You can. And I just learned about that technique from an artist in Chile. Um, you can fill it with, what is it called? Um, fix all. It's like a kind of like a paste that you mix up and you can, uh, you put it on your bathroom walls to patch up holes. You can fill that. You can use that and you spread it in. So here, I'll show you actually, I don't have any of the fix all, but, if you want to give definition to your pieces, there is this tool that you can use for um, 
charcoal, like charcoal drawings, but I actually use it to give definition to push out my hearts. And so it makes it look a little bit 3D, like it get, you can't really see it here, but it gives it an indentation. So once you do that, you can fill the backspace with the, with the fix all, and then it won't, it won't um, buckle. Cool, thank you. Um, I've got a couple more questions um, before we come to the close of our first virtual artist talk with Rachel Ann Palacios. Um, we have a question about collaboration. What collaborations have you done with other artists outside of your work with young artists? Or who are the artists you would want to collaborate with if you had the opportunity? New collaborations, like one of my main collaborative collaborative partners is that the right way to say it um is lily lanier she is an amazing amazing artist and human being um hi lily i love you i don't know if you're watching but she's one of my closest friends um she's she's an uh, she's an educator also and she's an origami artist so we did a couple of pieces last year for um somarts and she made this huge frida kahlo out of origami and it was super amazing. And then our other friend, one of my other best friends, Emily Winslow. Hi, Emily. I don't know if you're watching, but I love you too. Um, we both made, we, all three of us made these tiles to go around it. And it's about six feet tall and about four feet wide. So that was one of my first, like, main collaborations. I also did, uh, we also did a piece at the Women's Cancer Center of a Guadalupe in Repujado. And we did little tin tiles around it. Um, some more co collaborations that I made. Oh, with my, another art sister, Sally Rodriguez. I don't know if you're on Sally, but hi, Sally. I love you. Um, we did a dress for the San Jose Museum of Art in, um, I don't know, it was like 1997. Maybe, I don't know. It was a while ago, but we made a giant Frida Kahlo dress um, that represents, it was, it was the dress from the picture that she painted for Leon Trotsky and that was at the front entrance of a photo exhibit of Frida Kahlo's father so those are those are three of my main collaborators um and who do I want to collaborate with I don't know there's so many people that I want to work with that I I really would like to so one of the newest artists that I've seen she's in Chile um her name is Montserrat, and she does a lot of repujado art. And I've just really been inspired by her, by her kindness in me sending her questions from here, from America, asking her, "Well, what kind of what kind of tools do you use? Like, what kind of paint do you use?" And so we've been sharing stuff back and forth. So it'd be really nice to travel to Chile and actually do something collaborative with her. We've got a, another um, small technical question, and this will be our last little question, and then we'll um, talk a little bit about how people can find you, find your pieces, and support your work before we wrap up. Um, so we have a question of, uh, how are the little flowers made? Are they paper? Are they attached? Are they metal? Um, what metal are you using? Some of the flowers that are on the nichos are they're from mexico they're paper flowers that i buy um i don't if any of you've been to mexico city to the craft area it's like heaven there are stores and stores of lace and flowers and glitter and rhinestones and so i get a lot of my flowers from there some of the newer flowers that i have been making are made out of tin i learned how to do some flowers I'll show you. I put them on here and they're actually, I don't know if you can see them. These guys yeah. here, I actually cut tin pieces out and then I glue, I layer them and I glue them on top of each other so that they create like a three dimensional flower. And so it is the tooling, the same tooling aluminum, the soft 36 gauge. Um, and then I paint them with alcohol inks or Sharpie just to, to give them some color. So they are paper and they are, there are metal ones. Awesome. Um, as we start to wrap up, I would love to invite you to share where people can follow you, where they can find your art, and how they can support your craft and artistry. Well, I have an Instagram page and it's at Devikas Palacio and Devika in Arabic and Hindi means goddess. 
and my last name is Palacios, but Palacio without an S is palace. And so the whole, it means goddess's palace. So you can follow me there. Um, I also have a Facebook page, Facebook art page, um, Rachel Ann Palacios, Davika's Palacio, Hannah and Art. Um, how you could support, well, I mean, follow some of the stuff that I'm making during this, this quarantine. Um, and there's a really cool page on Facebook right now called um, Art in the Time of Corona, created by Valerie Medina. She's another amazing artist and kind of a, a really amazing soul sister from Oakland also. And so she's been asking people to post different things on there. So every time I make something or my kids help make something, I'll post it up there. So new stuff is up there along with a lot of other art. Um, and often, yeah. um, you often show at different um, craft fairs and artist vendor markets. Um, are you willing to take commission requests? Totally. I would love to take commission requests as long as it's within my like, comfort bubble I just get really nervous about not being able to fully come through for somebody if they ask to do something that's out of my comfort zone like I'll try it but I just I don't know I, I have to pump up my self-esteem a little bit more for certain things but I'm I'm open to suggestions and you know if when the time comes if you want to come to the crucible and learn from me you can um yeah let's make art together Yes, let's. I, I think I speak for all of us at The Crucible. We cannot wait to get back into the studio and create, and especially get to create with you, Rachel Ann. Um, so a big, big thank you to Rachel Ann Palacios. Um, we are so grateful to all who have joined our very first virtual artist talk here at The Crucible. We're no strangers to doing artist talks, but this is our very first one doing it online. So we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did and as much as we love to feature Rachel Ann Palacios. Um, we will be doing these uh, virtual artist talks every Friday at three o'clock. Our next artist that we're going to be featuring is Karen Smith, who is an incredible metalsmith artist and jeweler. Um, so definitely check back next Friday at three o'clock and every Friday, moving on forward at three o'clock, where we'll feature the incredible artistry um, of our educators at The Crucible. As you know, the Crucible is currently closed. We are making our way through this challenging time, but we can't do it without all of you. So we're asking the community to help support us by um, buying directly from our artists, checking out our website, donating to the Crucible, buying a gift certificate, or helping to spread the word. Just sharing about us and what we do helps us uh, fulfill our mission of bringing the art and the industrial arts to everybody. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. We are so glad that you could be here for our very first virtual artist talk hosted by The Crucible and featuring Rachel Ann Palacios, a repujado artist here at The Crucible. So thank you very much for joining us. We very much look forward to seeing you next Friday. And definitely check out everything that you could learn about The Crucible at thecrucible.org. That's thecrucible.org. And we look forward to connecting more with you every week. Be well, be safe, stay apart from one another, and we look forward to seeing you at the Crucible as soon as we possibly can. Thank you so much, everybody. It was great to see all your comments and, and all your well wishes. And yes, please, everybody stay safe. Please come to the Crucible when it's okay to be around people again and learn how to do. There's so many amazing things to do there. So yes, I would love, I would love to see you and... We're, we're happy that you joined us today. Thanks.